while at the same time retaining the person of God, who is a wonderfully multifarious unity. Moreover, Barth is said to affirm that the one God is person in the contemporary use of the term, while Father, Son, and Spirit are related as modes of the divine existence. However, a new terminology that is more satisfactory to the modern mind will not solve the problem. If God does not exist, or rather subsist, as three discrete subjects or agents, when we do away with the modern term person in the Trinitarian formula, the Logos doctrine, a key element in the Trinity doctrine which postulates Christ as a separate, distinct, creative agent, is destroyed. Any attempt to create an updated and yet scriptural terminology to describe the divine Godhead in Trinitarian terms or otherwise must satisfactorily and openly, without fear of charges of heresy, investigate the origin of the Trinity doctrine. Thank you. Thank you very much, our brother. If you enjoyed that, say amen. I always wondered where that doctrine came from. Now I'm going to get my dictionary and find out. Our first respondent is our brother W.C. Parkey from Poplar Bluff, Missouri. He's married, the father of four children. He has a B.A. from the University of Oklahoma. He's a member of the executive board, member of the curriculum committee, member of the board of publications, pastor, Cornerstone Tabernacle, Poplar Bluff, Missouri. He has various articles that have been published in the Pentecostal Herald and has written many lessons for word of flame literature. Brother W.C. Parkey is our first respondent. Thank you, Brother Tenney. I am thankful for the opportunity to be invited to be a part of this symposium. Just a little while ago, I didn't know how to spell it, and now I'm part of it. And I think it's a wonderful thing that it is happening, and we have this opportunity to hear these papers. I would like to express my appreciation to these men who have given of their time and talents to devote themselves to scholarship. They have gone into areas where many have lost their way and become shipwrecked concerning the faith. But these have returned to help us defend the faith with the benefit of their acquired knowledge. Saturday I received my copy of the manuscript to which I was to respond. If there was anyone here who was supposed to do this and you didn't respond, you're responsible for me being here. I didn't respond. I was drafted. In my evaluation concerning this paper, I would like to consider three aspects. Number one, the force of the argument. Number two, the strength of the references. And number three, the validity of the conclusions. First, I would like to commend the author for his research and the breadth of the scope he has undertaken to cover. He has attempted to cover, among other things, pagan triads of ancient civilizations, the Greek Logos Doctrine, Gnosticism, the Anti-Nicene Fathers, the Post-Nicene Trinitarians, and modern commentators up to and including Barth. With such a broad scope, certain areas cannot help but be neglected. A more limited area of study would have permitted the author to have more fully covered the subject and more completely established his claims. I noticed that he omitted the part that was probably the least effective of his paper. Happy birthday, brother. Amen. And uh, <laughs> Nevertheless, the author did establish that there were ancient pagan trinities in India, India, Mesopotamia, Japan, Egypt, and Babylon. However, to my understanding, he did not conclusively verify that they all came from Babylon any more than if I had a horse and you had a horse, it would mean we both got them from the same place. In his discussion of the Platonic and Neoplatonic philosophers, uh, Chalfant has emphasized that a triad was a feature of their teaching 
which is a commonly known and accepted fact, it is easy to accept the idea that theologians who had been schooled in Greek philosophy carried over their ideas in attempting to explain the Godhead. While I wholeheartedly conclude with the author's premise that the history of divine triads is not derived from the Old Testament, there is a school of study that says that there were polytheistic tendencies among the Hebrews until a later Old Testament period with the Jehovah as the chief among the gods. While, of course, I do not believe this, the author has done nothing to establish his contention uh, from biblical sources regarding the Hebrews with either biblical or extra-biblical references. This paper is filled with a multitude of proof texts that are interesting and helpful in the study of oneness. Can you say amen? Yes. And like Brother Tenney, we're all going to go home and just investigate all of these references. In evaluating this paper, I asked for and received helpful comments from Dr. Craig Shaw, who is a graduate of the Louisville Theological Seminary, Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. I feel that his comments would be helpful at this point, especially in view of the fact that when I brought the paper to him, he said, the first thing I want to tell you is, I am not a Trinitarian. I am not a classical Trinitarian. And I understand he has studied under a man in Louisville Theological Seminary, Dr. Frank Stagg, who is, is himself a non-Trinitarian, and who has said that uh, there are basic non-negotiables in biblical perspective. These non-negotiables include the oneness of God, His continuing presence in the world He has made, and the divine human nature of Jesus Christ. Dr. Shaw has said the following, and uh, this is Dr. Shaw. The paper appears as a deluge of information, a lot of which is good, but it does not follow any logical presentation. Rather, the data appear as a stacking of arguments, which, when weighted together, proves the force of the argument. Such a methodology places extreme confidences in secondary sources. I'm quoting Dr. Shell. He continues... I would have been much more impressed had the author taken one strain of philosophical thought and followed it. His method is akin to a biblical proof text method which does not belie a good understanding of the context of the argument. One cannot, for example, put the Trinitarian view of the West and the Alexandrian schools into one lump and suggest that they are all basically the same. He says... The writer does present two interesting ideas which could stand much more research and investigation. The impact of Logos Christology on Trinitarian formulations and the nature of triads in ancient culture. I suspect the latter is prominent, although not as prominent as Chalfant suggests, and I suspect the former is not as important as he suggests. Interestingly enough, he says... Early Catholicism followed Paul and the Synoptics and not the Joannine community, which was the heartthrob of the Gnostics. In regard to the conclusion, Dr. Shull says, since the author has not really presented a logical case out of which he can draw conclusions, the paper really does not have a concluding section. The generalization that he makes based upon weighted evidence is just like the evidence general. The argument for a free and open investigation is one with which I heartily concur, which is his last paragraph. If the classic theological formulation of Trinitarianism does not work, then it should be openly explored. And listen to this statement. One would guess, however, that the author would not be as open to doing the same with his view of the oneness of God. He should be here today, and he'd understand that we are open. Amen? Finally, while I have emphasized the weak points of this paper, I do want to reaffirm the value of the paper in calling for a more in-depth look at the origins of Logos Christology and the development of triads in ancient religions. This is not to say that much work has not already been done. 
It is to say that much of it is secondary and does not prove any logical antecedent relationship between, say, the Trinitarian Judeo-Christian heritage and the Babylonian Persian gods. That's the comments of Dr. Shull. In conclusion, let me say that William Chalfant has dealt with one of the most difficult areas of oneness research in writing, that of non-biblical sources. However, he has done what he set out to do and proclaims as his goal. He has investigated the origin of the Trinity doctrine. He has found a trinity in pagan religions, in philosophical speculations, and in theological reflection and formulation. If he has not satisfactorily established where it came from, he must continue his research, Brother Chalfant, because it is only from some source outside of the sacred scriptures that have been left us as a legacy by the early church will you find the sources of the trinity.